<laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and call this March 30th, 2023 meeting of the Somerville School Committee, meeting as a committee of the whole for personnel to order. Um, Dr. Boston Davis, will you call the roll? Yes, Chair Green. Dr. Ackman? Here. Mayor Ballantyne? Ms. Batone? Present. Dr. Phillips? Present. Ms. Dion? Here. Ms. Barish? Here. President Ewing Campen? Ms. Krupchen? Here. Mr. Green? Here. We have a quorum. Fantastic. Thank you so much. We have one item before us today as a, as a community, and that is the interview of Toby Romer to be superintendent of schools for Somerville Public Schools. Uh, Mr. Romer, just walk you through what's going to happen here. Uh, you'll be allowed to open with an opening statement, and then each of, the, um, each of the members of this committee has been given a category which I'll ask one question from. Um, after each question, members may have follow-up questions. After we go through that, we will open up the floor to, to members to ask questions on whatever strikes their fancy until we exhaust all questions and we'll be given the last word. Great. All right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I start with two questions, one about logistics and then one about core values. Um, so the question about logistics, logistics is, if you were chosen to be the superintendent of schools for Somerville, would you be available to start on July 1st? If not, when would you be able to start and how would you handle things in the interim? Uh, yes, I would be able to start on July 1st. Okay. And so the question about core values is? Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Opening statement. Should I start there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as the chair said, my name is Toby Romer. Uh, I currently serve as the assistant superintendent for secondary education in the Newton Public Schools, where I've worked for the past eight, eight uh, years. Uh, but prior to that, I worked for almost 20 years in the Boston Public Schools as a teacher, teacher leader, assistant principal, principal, and director of professional development. Uh, I live in Boston with my wife, who's a former school counselor and who directs a, a, a graduate program in school counseling, um, and my three kids who attend school in Boston um, as well. Um, again, it's, I'm really excited to be here today, and I've been incredibly excited to be part of this search process over the last month and a half and learning more about uh, the Somerville Public Schools and connecting today with students and educators and leaders um, in the schools. Um, I'm really looking forward to the, the possibility of being a educator and a leader with such thoughtful and de dedicated educators like I met today. Um, I like to say that my career has been a mission-driven career, working to ensure that all students have access, equitable access to high quality education. Uh, I've done that both in terms of where I've worked and how I've worked. Um, again, I spent the first approximately 20 years of my co career working in the Boston public schools, primarily in high poverty schools, um, and working there to ensure that all students had access to that high quality education I talked about. For the last eight years, I've worked in the Newton public schools, and I've been part of an amazingly uh, dedicated and talented leadership team that's been focused on ensuring that all students have access to the high expectations and high support that the community there expects. And I can talk more about that experience as well. Uh, throughout my career, I've had a variety of different roles and worked in a variety of different schools and contexts that I think have served me well and prepared me for a role such as this. Um, I started my career as uh, learning to be a social studies teacher as part of my undergraduate education. But at the same time, I was teaching ESL. I taught ESL to refugee youth in Boston. I lived in Ecuador for a year and taught English there. I came back to Boston. I, I even taught ESL at scale here in Somerville part-time um, at that point. I transi transitioned from ESL actually into teaching world languages, and I taught Spanish and even French in the Boston public schools before transitioning to a role as assistant principal. And then I was asked to apply and became the principal or head of school at Brighton High School in Boston, where I, where I served for five years. Um, at that point, it was 13 years ago, my, my twins were born, my second and third children, and I stepped down from being high school principal to get some more balance in my personal and professional life and being able to, to do that well. But that actually led to 
an amazing new chapter and learning opportunity in my professional career. I ultimately became the Director of Professional Development at Orchard Gardens K-8 School in Roxbury, which is a Boston public school as well. I was part of a leadership team that was uh, in charge of the turnaround of the school. The school was really struggling at the time we went to work there. And I worked with amazing educators um, from across the Boston Public Schools who joined our, our teaching and leadership team there. And we focused on using teacher leadership and the arts as part of our strategy to turn the school around and made incredible progress and strides while we were there. I really was immersed at that point as a primarily secondary high school educator in the world of K-8. to Spent lots of time with our elementary teams, learning more about the standards and strategies of elementary ed and what they had in common and what was different and what was to be learned about them from the point of view of a secondary educator. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Um, I haven't had in my career an opportunity to pursue a doctorate, but I think you'll hear a theme of, of constant learning and growth from the different experiences I've had um, and working in different schools in different roles. And that was certainly one of them that was incredibly important to me. Uh, eight years ago, I, I took another, another risk and another opportunity. Uh, I left the Boston Public Schools, which had essentially been my professional home for my entire career, uh, and became the Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education in Newton. Um, it was a, a very different opportunity for me, but also a logical next step in other ways. But I had a learning opportunity to, to work in a well-resourced suburban district and see what, this, what the strengths and the opportunities for growth were there. Um, I mentioned I work with an incredible team of diverse and talented educators there, and we've really focused our work, uh, among many things, on equitable practices and anti-racist strategies to ensure that our school system works well for all students, particularly those that have been historically underserved by, by schools in America and in our district as well. Um, at this point in my career, I'm uniquely interested in this position. It's the only position that I applied for, superintendent of schools in Somerville. Because if I'm going to have a larger influence in a district and a community, I want to be sure it's one that shares my core values and commitments. And I feel that I found that here in Somerville and everything that I've experienced today has only reaffirmed that. The conversations that I've had with educators, with students, with other leaders and, and folks on the school committee. Um, I wasn't able, I wasn't ready to apply for this position earlier this winter as we had our own leadership transition in Newton and I was really dedicated to ensuring that that went well and supporting the incredible team of people I work with there. But when the opportunity to reapply came up, I was excited at the opportunity and have really been enjoying um, this process. I feel like my experiences and background um, are well suited to taking, uh, taking this role and, and leading Somerville through all the opportunities and challenges that, that we see going forward. I know we'll talk more about those tonight. Um, I appreciate everybody being here and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. So um, I'd love if you could walk us through your core values and share with us uh, a time when you've had to negotiate conflict in, in defense of those values. In defense of the values, thanks. Um, so the opportunity to apply here and, and reflect on my career is, is a great opportunity to articulate those values and, and express them explicitly. So thank you for the question. One of, the, one of my core values around students is the, the, the belief that all students are able to learn at, at high levels. And it's a very simple statement, but it's one that can really drive our actions as educators and the way that we uh, work and think and reflect on the systems in our school and our own practices. So if, if we know and we're confident that all students can learn at very high levels, when we see outcomes from our school system, whether it's in our classroom, in our school, or in our district, that don't show all students uh, achieving at high levels and patterns of uh, underrepresentation, whether it's of students of color, students uh, with disabilities, or other backgrounds, we have to look at ourselves and see how is what we've done as educators help produce these outcomes and what can we do differently. So that, that core value, while, while fairly simple, I think promotes a level of responsibility and accountability for us as educators and leaders of the system to be constantly reflective and constantly um, strive to do better. That's driven a lot of the work that I've done, um, equity-driven work in Newton, but my work throughout my career in believing that all, all of our students in, in urban areas or suburban areas are capable of high levels of achievement. And when, when we fall short of getting them to that mark, we've got to go back to the drawing board and adjust or refine or renew what we're doing. Um, so that's, that's an important core value. In terms of a time where um, conflict has been involved in, 
in supporting that value. Um, I can think of a number of a number of different ways um, that that's been been true. Um, this week in this week in Newton is, is a, a perfectly good example. We've been working um, and listening carefully to a group of parents in Newton who who felt that um, the standards of our school system were slipping and they weren't as high as they should have been. And some folks were um, quietly linking that to some of the equity work and the work to make the school uh, schools work better for all students as being the cause of that. Um, and really, that that work is rooted, rooted and grounded in this idea that all students are, are capable and we should have high expectations for all students. So when people started pushing back on that, we worked really hard, first of all, to articulate why some of the work that we've done uh, in the district to make our, our schools work for all students and, and for all, all faculty and um, faculty of color, staff of color as well to support and retain them. Um, and doing that, and there, we had a hearing earlier this week in Newton where we had literally hundreds of, of parents uh, of our students come out in support of the work that we've been doing in support of our DEI department and our terrific director there in support of the school leaders that have been putting these values into practice with our support, um, in support of our, the affinity groups that we have for staff and for students where they can connect with students from other backgrounds such as their own. Um, the work we've done to make our schools inclusive for students of all genders, um, including non-binary students. Um, and it was really a positive experience to hear those voices and give them a chance to articulate what the benefits have been of our work. Um, we have to be careful also to listen to all of our families and understand what are the concerns being raised by those that have questions about um, how challenging and rigorous our schools are and if we could be doing better. Uh, um, and those conversations with parents are great to have. What is, you, what is your child's experience like and where are we falling short of meeting their needs? Um, but it does not have to be a, a either or game of doing, having excellence or equity in the work that we're doing. Mr. Tom? Thank you, through you, Chair Green. Um, that was a really, interesting example of a particular core value, and I apologize. I don't think I, we had asked you to talk about other core values. Can you just share those a little bit? Sorry, other? Just, uh, you said that was your core other value? Other values? Yeah, we just kind of want to. Draw that, yeah, so other, other core values. I mean, one of my core values and one of my uh, visions of leadership that I would certainly cite is the idea of uh, authoritative leadership, which is something that, uh, that I borrow and I take from the work of Daniel Goleman, who's a, a, a writer on leadership and, and many other areas. And authoritative leadership is really the idea that it's a leader's job to create a vision and articulate a vision and a direction that an organization or any group of people is going in, and then to help facilitate and lead a group of people towards that vision and support them, hold them accountable, remind people of the direction that we collectively have chosen to go and make that, make that our shared work. And that, I think that's really emblematic of how I see uh, the role and the values, one of my core values for how I lead and how I work with other educators and educational leaders and community members is uh, wherever possible, creating a shared vision and direction for the work that we want to do, and then facilitating the stakeholders and the people that are going to take part in making that come alive so that we can come up with the best plan possible to do it. I don't uh, purport to have all of the answers or have all of the strategies. At this point in my career, I have had a lot of experiences that can be really helpful in and instructive, um, but knowing that no matter how good a plan we, we have, it's not gonna be good unless everybody has bought into it in terms of the direction we're gonna go and the way we're gonna create that, that plan. So that applies to uh, many different things in our schools and our school system, whether it's thinking about new instructional strategies, whether it's thinking about reorganizing how high school classes are structured or a schedule for, for a school. Um, there, there, there are not only one right answers to most of the questions and the goals that we're going to put out there and having a plan and um, an action plan that everybody has helped to co-create and everybody feels responsible to one another for, for following through on is important. So that comes out of that, that core value of, of how, how to lead in a system and I try to hold myself to that too. Dr. Ackman. What does the what is the role that special education plays uh, in public school today, and what role should it play? Okay, um, well, special education is 
certainly in a technical sense, guided by federal and state laws that clearly defines uh, what it what role it plays, and that means that we've got we have a responsibility, and and students and families have a right to make sure students with disabilities are identified, and then have an individualized plan to make sure that they're supported in reaching academic goals, and that they can do that in the least restrictive environment. And so I think there's those basic understandings are super important because a lot of the, those laws and legislations came out of a civil rights movement for people with disabilities to ensure that they had full access to the educational opportunities that other folks have. Um, and so making sure that we're uh, doing that in every case, both in a technical sense, crossing the T's and dotting the I's that are required by special education law is, is one level of my answer to that question. I think it's a much larger question though and a great question in terms of uh, you can't answer that question without thinking about what does our current educational environment look like in our classrooms, in our schools, and how does it support and promote the success of all students? If we go back to that idea that all students are capable of, of learning at high levels, that includes students with disabilities of many different kinds. There may be different levels of support, maybe more time, more resources that some students may need to get get to that that place where they meet the expectations that we have for all students but we've got to be doing that for all students as part of a universally designed system no matter what and then disabilities really only appear as important in education out of that when they, we're not able to help students without some specialized instruction um, I had the I had the honor of taking a class with Tom Hare, who's um, one of the authors of the IDEA, uh, federal civil rights, uh, federal special education legislation in graduate school, and he would ask the question, what's special about special education? Um, and that's both about where is the specialized instruction that's required to be part of it, but also if, we, if we're offering special education services or classrooms or programs, are they really amazing, incredible, supportive places that any any child might benefit from in addition to the specialized pieces of it, and if not, how do we, how do we work on continuously improving them so that they're um, worthy of our high standards uh, that we would have for any educational classroom? Uh, so I think that's a second part of it. The, in, the educational environment that we're in is always gonna be a part of conversations we have about special education and how we make sure all students succeed as a result of that. Yep. Ms. Barish. Thank you, Chair Green. Through you, um, what, who are the stakeholder groups that you reach out to when making decisions or when communicating decisions? How would you build those relationships if you were to become our next superintendent? Great. Well, I, it, it, it certainly depends which decisions we're talking about. Um, and I think there, there's, there's tons of important decisions that we need a, the broadest possible level of input on. And, and thinking about cultivating a system as a leader of a district so that we have not only channels of communication and constant input, but ways of reaching out and getting specific input from folks who are obviously uh, the, our educators, our parents, families, caregivers, our students are crucial and important and we often leave them out of that. And then there's so many more stakeholders in the Somerville community or in any community that includes our partners in, in the city, city government and leadership as well as um, community agencies that we, we no doubt will partner with and work towards our goals on nonprofits in the community um, and other members of the community. So those, that's a, a laundry list of groups, right? And, and, and there's no single one way to connect. The thing I will say is to the more general question, different, different questions and different level, levels of specificity may require different amounts of input from different parties in that list. So. I do think it's really important that there are some decisions which are educational decisions that we need to go first and foremost to teachers and school leaders to get their input on and certainly consult and inform like broader groups of folks if it's something very particular to the educational expertise that we have. Um, and then there's others that have like broader impacts and that we need to include much more of a voice for families and for students and for others. Um, I know one of the things the, the school committee and the district is grappling on is adding common planning time to the schedule and thinking about what that, what that could look like. And it's certainly a very much an educational decision. There's tons of research about why it's important for teams, whether grade level teams at the elementary level, content teams at the, at the middle or at the high level have time to work together and plan, look at student work, look at our results, figuring out how to, how to do the work better, as I said before, and thinking about our core values. Um, 
but that also, if we're doing that with early releases, that impacts families, that impacts other parts of the community. So depending on what direction you're gonna go with that, we may need a broader input process. Um, so I think that's a good example of how different decisions may require different amounts of st stakeholder input. And again, depending on even what some of the proposals are, it might change that, that uh, calculus. Dion. Um, your letters of recommendation speak of good relationships with the educators of Newton, but Newton educators themselves have told me a bit of a different story. They feel betrayed by the way the new high school schedule was rolled out, saying that their feedback was disregarded and promises were broken. How would you adjust things if you had to do that process over again? Absolutely. Um, so I, I think that's great to hear that feedback because I'm constantly learning as we're trying to do the work that we're doing about how we can do it better and, and have reflected on that question already. I do think there are, there are also a large number of educators who feel good about the process uh, for the way that we did redesign our schedule at both Newton North and Newton South um, over really a five year period in total. Um, and it was a process that included leadership from uh, the, the president of the teacher union was on a committee that we worked with along with a, a cross section of educators from both high schools, leaders, um, that helped put together a proposal. We were, I was talking about this earlier today with educators at uh, Somerville High School about the, the um, amazing number of different variables involved in a high school schedule from time on learning requirements, career and technical education requirements at a comprehensive high school like Somerville, um, thinking about the different needs in different content areas and how that plays out for different groups. So inevitably in a schedule design process, there's always trade-offs and everybody will not be perfectly happy with the results. So as context, all of that, I think what was particularly challenging about our change of the schedule is it happened at, as part and parcel of some of the changes that happened during the, during the pandemic. Um, and so we, we created a new schedule that was designed to both create improved conditions for teaching and learning at the high school, but also facilitate a later start for our high schools, which was an important uh, value and uh, directive of the school committee. So we had a couple different things we were trying to do. And then the pandemic happened in the middle of that process. We had created a really terrific schedule with a very inclusive process um, and that there was a lot of buy-in towards. And then as we were coming out of the pandemic, there was an opportunity to implement the new schedule in alignment with the collective bargaining agreements we had made and everything else. Um, but it was also a hard time. It continues to be an incredibly challenging time to be an educator anywhere in Newton and in Somerville. And uh, so we saw an opportunity to make the change at that point based on all of the work we had done, years of work we had done leading up, leading up to that. But I think to some it did feel abrupt. It did feel like they hadn't, they hadn't had the chance to process it or get the support that they needed to teach differently. The thing about changing a high school schedule, it's not just a technical adjustment to the number of minutes of different things. It can really, it can really promote positive change in many of the ways that we do work in our classrooms, it can impact instruction, it can impact the teamwork we have, and it obviously incredibly powerfully helpful in impacting the student experience in a positive way, and that was a big part of the plans we had. Uh, but people know that they need support, and we had, we had collectively bargained as well as just logically agreed to provide a lot of support to educators, and um, it was hard to do that, and it was a really hard time for educators um, the beginning of last school year when we did that. So I, that's part of what I understand where some of those feelings were coming from. And I and would have to think really hard about how we could better support educators to not, th not get that kind of feedback, um, but still move forward with powerful work that was collaboratively designed. Thanks, yep. Hey, Brown, are, you, are you ready for your question? Or try? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> So this is a budgeting question. Uh, the people in Somerville, parents, residents, love to be engaged. The public's knowledge of our finances is an important one. So how would you communicate to city officials, to the public, parents, uh, and media over the finances? Thank you, great question. Um, I think there's both the, the budget, budget development process relevant to that question of creating a budget and a, a financial plan for the year in the schools, and then there's the ongoing supervision and oversight of that that's so important for the school committee as well as the public and, and members of the city government as well. So in terms of the budget development process, I think it's really important to have a participatory process internally within the school system and with school leaders 
uh, in particular, uh, and central office administrators to make sure that we're, we're creating a proposed budget which is in align with our, with our priorities and our goals and our principles. Um, and in that phase, working really closely with, with our city partners to understand what the financial constraints and opportunities may be in any given year and how that fits together with the larger financial plan for the city. And then having a second phase of that transparent and, um, and clear process with the, larger, with the larger community through school committee meetings as well as other budget workshops or um, uh, feedback opportunities that we might have about a budget to a plan for the financial plan for the year. Going forward from that point, once we're rolling with a budget and up and running, I think regular financial updates to the school committee are a really helpful way to do that. And I think any kind of reporting that we're doing, and that happens regularly in the Newton Public Schools in my current role, um, which is where I have district experience around that. And uh, that includes some very detailed reporting by my colleagues who work in the business finance and planning department there, and an opportunity for the school committee and others to ask questions about specific line items, where costs are running higher or lower than expected, or any changes that need to, have hap need to happen. And I think that kind of communication to the school committee, I think this is true for many issues, needs to be complemented by communication and opportunities for feedback with the larger public as well. So reflecting those agenda items and those discussions in our district newsletters, uh, and other, other communication that may be coming from schools with families to make sure they're updated or know where to go if they want more information. Um, and then I know there, there are feedback mechanisms built into the school committee and your work with the public as well. And that, I think that's another opportunity. And if there are opportunities for me to participate or, for, or help in that process, I'd be open to that as well. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Dion. With the limited amount of time in the school day, it can be difficult for educators to adequately address both students' academic needs and their social emotional needs. How will you ensure that all students' needs are being met in both areas? In both um, educational, academic, and social emotional areas? Yeah, perfect. Uh, it's something that we've, we've been very much focused on in my current work in the Newton Public Schools, but throughout my career of thinking about Schools is not just a driver of academic success for students, but thinking about the whole child and that's part of the, the values of this school district and this community um, and how we're preparing students for success in life, for success after, after they graduate from school and being healthy and well all throughout that process. Um, it's about, a lot of times I think we think about those two things as being um, separate and um, both requiring like extra, well, all right, we've done with academics, now we're gonna do social emotional learning. And the reality is that when, when done well, um, they're embedded and overlapping within a, within a classroom experience for students and within the larger school experience for students. So we, I've done a lot of work uh, most recently with responsive classroom as a structure and a framework for teachers to learn more about how the way that they're teaching content can build social emotional skills and engagement. It can build obviously community in the classroom based on different ways of grouping students and having students working together and teaching them the skills that they need to collaborate with one another as part of that social emotional learning curriculum, not requiring more time in another part of the day and another, another subject area for an elementary teacher or another of taking a break from learning at the secondary level so we can do SEL, like that's not the way uh, that it's done. And I think doing it that way, it's intensive for educators. You, you started your question with that because it requires sometimes rethinking the way things are done or learning new skills or new strategies in their classroom. Uh, but ultimately, that, that skill building that we need to do through professional development um, and through practice and coaching with others um, ultimately makes, makes it a manageable thing to do and to be able to know that you're touching and meeting all those uh, goals that we have in the designated amount of time we have in schools. Thanks. Description. My question is about collective bargaining. So what is your experience at the bargaining table? Can you share a time when there was tension at the table? How did you handle it and what did you learn? Great. Um, so I've, I've been a member of the uh, collective bargaining team for the new public schools uh, for our past contract um, a little over three years ago, and I'm a member of the, the bargaining team again for our current contract, which is being negotiated now. Um, it's an important opportunity to 
work on uh, creating a framework in our work with teachers and other educators within the contract to, to try to move forward on important goals for the system. It's a way to support educators, a way to have shared, shared uh, leadership and understanding of, of big initiatives or things that may change. Um, so uh, one, one time that I did work collectively and it was related to the question that you, uh, Ms. Dion asked earlier um, in developing a uh, new schedule for the schools. We knew it, in our case, it was something that was covered by the contract in terms of what the schedule would look like and some of the parameters of time on learning and the amount of classes and preparation time and other things that teachers had. Um, so we did have uh, members of our teachers association as well as the president part of the committee up front that designed the schedule that was ultimately proposed. And so that was designed together. And then we brought that to the bargaining table um, as something that had been collectively created to work out at the, at the contractual phase of, so what would a contract look like to represent that? Um, so that, that resulted in a, nonetheless in a, in a contentious process. Bargaining is often that where you're trying to decide on what are the parameters um, for what, what to do. And again, I think in, in typical bargaining fashion, we ended up with a, with a resolution that was good by sort of staking out our positions, and, but also more importantly, staking out our values and why we were asking for what we were at the bargaining table. In that case, it was a little bit easier because we had already done some of the work around the shared values of what we wanted for the high school experience for both, for both students and teachers. Um, so we, that we didn't have to do that first step, but then it was figuring out what would the contract language look like that would allow us to, to put that into place, but for teachers and educators to still feel like they had the protections and support in the contract that they needed. Um, and ultimately, again, we, were, we got to an agreement on what that would look like um, that worked for both sides. Um, so again, some, some very, I think, uh, typical and traditional strategies of compromise, proposing and compromising and looking for areas of commonality and moving forward from that. Um, and trying to keep your eyes on the on the goal and the values that are driving that as you're having those conversations so that it's you may have differences of opinion about positions but you're working towards something that's understood by both sides at the very least if not shared and agreed to dr. Phillips please tell us how you define equity and how you've used the approach or the concept to improve student outcomes. Yeah. Um, so when I think of equity, I'm thinking about providing for all students what they need to be successful. Um, and we know that that can often be different from providing equal, equal things to what all students need. I think many of us are familiar with the graphic or the meme that shows the three children of different heights tr trying to look over a fence at a baseball game and knowing that some students need a box or a, a phone book if we still have those to stand on to see over the fence. Um, and I think that's a really instructive visual and helpful for people to learn. I think we also, as we think about equity, though, need to go beyond that and thinking about um, what, are, what, what are some of the structures in place, what are some of the systems that we've created as educators in a society that make it so that students in, in the case of that meme of different heights can't all see the game equally effectively. Uh, you know, so there's other versions and iterations of that, that graphic or that meme that show a see-through fence or, or no fence. And I think um, that's a, a deeper and I think more challenging part of equity, but one that really gets to our core values even further of all, if all students can learn and are capable of doing that, why is our system set up to make it inherently harder for some to be successful than others? And does it have to be that way? I think. And, you know, it, a lot of my recent learning about um, systems of racism is that the systems that are set up today were not set up to ensure that all students would succeed. In fact, most of them were designed or many of them were designed to ensure that only some succeeded and others didn't and that was often predictable based on race or other determinants. So to be truly equitable, we, we, we not only need to think about what additional support, again, additional time, addi additional strategies some students may need, but think about why are we getting the outcomes that we are where some are successful and some not, and how can we change the, the level of the playing field um, or the height of the fence, um, if you will, um, to, to be able to do that. So that's a, a second, I think, even more important, powerful, and challenging part of a definition of equity. Dr. Ackman and myself. Can you give us an example of how um, you've done that? That was the second part of your question. Yes, thank you. Um, so as we as we've looked at um, achievement in my in my current in my current role in Newton Public Schools, one of the one of the things we've looked at is is uh, when we have honors or AP courses, how are students from different backgrounds and different races accessing those? 
and when I got to Newton, and, and before that we knew that if you went to an AP class, you would not see a representative distribution of students from our population based on race, based on disability, based on other factors as well. Gender in certain subjects was uh, a, a determinant of who was entering and being successful in certain subjects and in certain honors classes. Um, and so thinking about how, how do we take that on? So some of the things we did fit into that first half of the definition of equity. And again, working with leaders and creating shared values, they're not all things that I did personally, but created a system and work with colleagues so that the, our expectations and our direct, direction to that idea of, of, of leadership were clear and that we'd work together on those. So looking at, are there biases in how we're selecting and recommending students for some of these classes if we're requiring that? And you know, in some cases it was simple as if you wanted to take AP English, you had to come after school to do an assessment to see if you were doing that. And that was clearly already creating a barrier for some students based on motivation or their commitments after school and a number of other things of who would do it. Um, if we were thinking about, even, even if we we're thinking about you had to have certain grades to get into a class, um, we, we thought about, well, is that always saying what we think it's saying about our students' achievements and could we start to change that? Um, the other thing that we did that's, I think, more aligned with the first part of the definition, and this started before I was there and we've been very supportive of it, is we have a calculus project, which is a program that starts in seventh and eighth grade for students of, students of color and low-income students who are among those underrepresented in our highest level math classes to provide extra support um, and preparation and also community and affinity group for them um, in summer times, in after school times, to make sure that they were accessing um, and getting to that level of calculus. And it's been very effective, the number of students who've been in that program. But when we, when we stop and think about it as well at the same time, what we realize is that it's our system that's creating those patterns, right? Something that we're doing with our, how we're teaching math and we're, how we're educating students is yielding these results. And so something like the calculus project, which is invaluable uh, for the students to participate, it's a, it's a crutch or it's a workaround for something that we haven't solved in how we've created the system. So we've also looked at our curriculum in our math classes. We've also looked at the, the kinds of tasks that students were being asked to do and tried to be very critical. And again, following best practices, following the incredible research from NCTM, the National Council of Teachers of Math and others, uh, and there's incredibly new and innovative math curricula out there um, worked at trying to, to diversify the way that math is taught so that more students, based on what we provide to all students who were black, Latinx, from low income, or any other student group, were gonna be successful in math at the same rates or, or higher than anybody else. Um, so that's an embodiment of that second part of the definition of, of equity that I think is so important and is, is not a simple fix. It's not about changing a rule or stopping doing something. It's about long-term long instructional work. I think hopefully you'll hear a theme in, in more of my answers of getting back to the quality of the instruction that happens in the classroom, which is not a quick fix, but is what ultimately makes schools so much better for all students, and that's a good example. Talking on waves, so I will no, ask. Oh, okay. Dr. Ackman. I appreciate it, Chair Green. Through the chair, um, you spent all day in the district. How should we move forward with equity in mind? I'm going to need to spend more days to be able to answer that question firmly. And I say that jokingly, but um, I think several people ask me, like, what would you do? What do you see? What do you want to do? I, I think in each of the different leadership roles that I've had, it's been really important to me um, not to just have sort of the same playbook of, of strategies and activities that, are, that work well everywhere, but spend that time building community with the people that you're working with, uh, spend time learning from people, what are the strengths, what are the assets we have in our community that we can build off of, and identifying through looking at data, through observations, through talking to people about their experiences, particularly people who have not been as well served in the district as others, who are likely people of color, people from different, different backgrounds, immigrant groups, English learners, um, and others, and, and making a plan with them. So I, I don't want to answer that question unilaterally and, and make it sound like I, I have the answers or things that I've done before is what I would do here, because I think each, each thing that I might talk about as examples here that you see on my resume is based on a dialogue and, and collaborative process in the spaces where I am. So that's not answering your question. If there's a follow-up that could help get it further, I'm happy to do that. But I, I feel really strongly about that.
Thank you. Um, how do you then engage those communities to have those conversations, mm -hmm. especially many that might be difficult based on traumatic experiences, mm -hmm. based on whatever. Yeah. So how, how do you, I shouldn't have said whatever, but how, how do you engage yep. with the communities, especially the ones that are hardest to access, yeah. to really, with equity in mind, to make education work for them? Um, so I guess I'll give an example of, of one way that I did that, which I think was really powerful and helpful. And again, I, I think it's, it's a, a kind of, a, a way of working and getting feedback that could be helpful in a lot of different contexts. Um, when I first got to Newton, we, we took a look at our, our student responses to the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS, which asked students a lot of questions at the um, middle and high school level, about mostly about risky behaviors that they may be involved in, but it also has a set of questions about how connected they feel to their school and how connected they are to different adults in their school. And we saw an alarming gap in the, in the level of connectedness that our black and Latinx students felt towards their school communities uh, as opposed to other students in the schools. So that, that data was cer certainly a first step of a helpful call to action and a call to alarm that that was unacceptable. How people feel about their schools, that you may be able to have certain excuses or explanations of why other other outcome measures may be different for different groups, but we as educators own that 100%. There's nobody else making people feel a certain way or a certain level of connection with their school than us. Um, and so we had to take action. But we did a couple things. We also designed a connectedness survey ourselves. Um, this is prior to some, there's some new tools out there that I think do this really well for schools. Uh, but we designed our own connectedness survey. We work with, with our data folks. We looked at different batteries out there and we give that survey now every year to students three through three through eight and in high school. And we can look at that with a lot more detail to hear from students, not just how connected you feel from school, but thinking about extracurricular activities and their experiences with their peers and their experiences with their teachers, their experiences in the classroom, in the hallway. Uh, so many different parts of that questions that are really helpful for us. But far more, I think what I wanted to say more importantly than that, when we got that, those results, I pulled together uh, a committee of teachers and leaders from both of the high schools in Newton that was very diverse, included teachers and staff of color and others. And we set out to create focus groups with, with students of color that were, were part of that gap in connect, connectedness and talk to them specifically about what were the things that were happening during their day that were leading to them not to feel connected or not feel good about their school environment. And uh, we did that by having, you know, making sure that the folks on that committee and they were part of those focus groups were students who had really strong relationships with a broad array of students and that we could, knew we could get uh, good responses to it. And even in that case, like I as a central office administrator, that wasn't part of my job. I worked and facilitated that team, but they went out and they worked with their classes, they worked with affinity groups, they worked with different groups in the school to hear from the kids directly, what's, what's going on that you might feel this way? And some, some students didn't feel that way, but it certainly was a higher percentage. And we, we, we made, and I helped put it together for our group, like a 12-page report that listed out eight different categories of areas within the school where things were happening for kids on a regular basis that were really impacting that level of connectedness. And we, we turned that report into a professional development experience for teachers during the summer, um, and we shared it with school leaders so they could build on it during the school year um, to try to change those patterns of things that are happening, everything from microaggressions that students were experiencing, from issues and conflicts with their peers that weren't being uh, handled well, think, think the perceived differential uh, treatment of some students and others in our disciplinary system, and whether, whether it was real or not, it was having a really terrible effect on how they felt about things. Um, the kinds of uh, extracurricular club activities that were offered, the importance and the positive power of having affinity groups and other spaces where students of color could connect with their peers and, and uh, educators that were like them. So that was a lot of work. Um, and it was a deep dive into sort of one data point from one survey, uh, but it yielded tremendous benefits and it's helped us create an ongoing feedback loop too where we're keeping in touch with that and we're seeing where we're getting higher levels of connectedness that's more representative of our school, school population and trying to increase that for all students um, and seeing where it hap hasn't happened or it's lagged. Um, but that's a super powerful uh, experience that I think we could duplicate for other issues where we want to dig deeper and we want to reach out and connect. Yep. I have a follow-up. So as you mentioned, 
Uh, many of the systems are, I say most of the systems, are working as designed and the outcomes they're designed to get, which is to advantage certain groups and disadvantage others. Um, can you talk about how you've managed to change some of these systems, and in particular, how you handled groups that may have benefited from the old systems, sometimes not even realizing they were benefiting from it, and obviously, the sense of loss as those, as those systems changed. Yeah. So it's, it's super important that we not necessarily think about any changes, equitable changes we're making as a zero-sum game, and that we're moving around like a limited a limited uh, set of positive opportunities from some students to others. Uh, so I think, I think that's a big, a big part of it, and that's easy to say and much harder to do. But I think what it ultimately gets to is, it's right, we had a conversation with a group of educators at um, Somerville High earlier today. It's, it, uh, of the scope of things we need to do, it's relatively easy to identify inequities in our systems and point out outcomes that we're not comfortable with based on our values. Um, and it is almost never, the right thing to just say, we should just stop doing that, or we should just end that practice, uh, or do the opposite. Because, like you said, these are systems, and they're designed to get these outcomes, and they tend to inevitably like regrow the same results through a different manner when you take a fairly simplistic approach to changing something complex like that. So as I mentioned back to the, the math outcomes, typically what we need to do to both have a change be effective and really have a positive effect and not have unintended effects it is gonna take a long time. It's ultimately almost always gonna get back to the teaching in the classroom and how we're teaching and how we can do that better to meet all students. And I think also part of that is when we do it well, we're not disadvantaging some who have had historical privileges to, to benefit others, but we're creating a new system in which all students are able to succeed. I mentioned the group of uh, families in Newton that brought forward their concerns about the rigor of the high school. It, it, some cases that was more of a political statement, but for many of those students, they were reporting, my child is not enjoying school or having a positive experience right now because of certain things that are happening. And I think we have a responsibility to try to make systems that work for all students and not just tip the balance from one, one place to another. Um, certainly easier said than done, but when we get to more of the root causes of the issues that are happening, and so often that's what's happening in the classroom, it goes back to, uh, deep professional development goes back to new and redesigned curriculum. It goes back to um, getting constant feedback from students about how they're experiencing that classroom. So we're implementing things both with fidelity and a way that works for all kids. It's more likely to not not just strip privilege from some and give it feel like it gives it to others. I'm going to follow up and push respect on that just, mm -hmm. just a smidge. Um, I think it, we often in equity work focus on schools' role as purveyors of knowledge, which obviously, yes, is an attitude game. You know, all students learning calculus doesn't keep anyone from learning calculus. Correct. But unfortunately, in the society we live in, that's not all schools' purpose is, right? Mm -hmm. And um, a, a mentor of mine once pointed out that when low-income families ask, how's my kid doing? They're usually asking, is my kid learning the skills they need Let's move on to the next level. When middle and high income parents ask, how, how's my kid doing? They're asking, how's my kid doing compared to other kids? Mm -hmm. and, and as much as American, one of the roles in American schools is to filter and sort to dole out a, a, a limited number of places in the elite meritocracy, mm -hmm. there is a time when giving to all is taking from those who are used to having that space. How do you handle those situations? Yeah. So. Really good question because there's no easy answer to that, right? And so you're naming a real mm -hmm. dilemma and a challenge that I think we will all face together in, in doing real deep equity work where we're, we're, we're challenging those historical patterns. I will say the more we've done the work up front to name our values and our shared commitment to creating different outcomes, the more we'll have collective answers, I think, as p political leaders in, this, in the city, in this community, for the school system, for the educational leaders uh, within the school system, and the other members of the public to know this is one of those times that we were talking about when we all sat down and agreed that these were our values and this was important work. If you agreed to that, if you signed on at that point, then you, you can't be opposed to this step even though maybe there's some personal sacrifice for you. 
um, and, and being resolute in that. And I know that's where you, you start to access deeper levels of power and privilege as people might fight back against that. Um, but I, I think that's, if we're committed to doing that, then we're committed to doing that and we have to collectively, the we of the community um, and the will of the larger values that are at stake here, be willing to do that. Um, and again, constantly listening to understand what those concerns are that people have. And so if it is just saying what my child's not doing better than everybody else anymore, as you said, in that more relative sense of how's my child doing, uh, helping to redefine success in the community. What, what does that mean? And not uh, you know, pushing back on that definition of success because I think when you take that uh, to a broader, a broader community understanding, people can get behind that and not let those individual voices carry the day. There may be discord and there may be like conflict as a result of it, but it doesn't have to be that that's the, that's the end of the conversation as a result. Thank you. Ms. Patel. Through you, Chair Green. Um, my question is about leadership style. Can you um, tell me about a time when you became a leader of an established team? What did you do in an effort to create a shared sense of purpose and develop a high functioning team? What worked and what did not work? Great question. Um, I, I will say, like, I've really prided myself on the work that I've done in, in building teams, leading teams, and also coaching and leading other leaders who lead teams throughout my work. Uh, my work at Orchard Gardens K-8, to I was explicitly coaching 18 teacher leaders who were leading the, the teams of their colleagues on how to build community, how to build share vision and purpose, how to stay on track, how to problem solve when they got off track. Um, and that, that level of coaching we actually found to be indispensable to being effective, and I found the same thing for myself. So as I'm a leader of a team, and I'll give a specific example, when, um, uh, when I came to Brighton High School, I took over a team of veteran educators. I was in my early 30s, I took over a vet veteran educator leaders who were all um, much more senior and I had held their roles for a long time, some of whom had been my supervisors in the past, and I became the head of school and, fac and facilitating that team. Uh, so it was super important to rely on some of just the best practices in team, team management. So uh, making sure we weren't just jumping right down to the hardest business, but you, creating team and uh, community as important agenda items as a part of our work together. Uh, creating, uh, at the time we called them norms, I would call them group agreements now about how we wanted to work together. Having people reflect on what, what have been the qualities of effective teams you've been on, what's worked, what hasn't. And then also, uh, this is the more rare part, having regular routines to revisit those group agreements. So we start each of my meetings that I do now with my middle school principals in Newton with a, a group agreement of the day. And whoever brought snacks for that meeting gets to pick out what's the group agreement that you wanna highlight for today. And is it something that we're doing well? Maybe it's something that you think needs a little attention. Um, even if something as simple as, you know, we haven't all been getting here on time and I've been getting here on time and I've been sitting to wait for everybody. I'm hoping that we can do better on that. Um, so uh, monitoring and feeding those group agreements and not having them just exist once at the beginning of the year and come back to them. Um, and then again, because that's really the, where, where I've gone wrong in the past is not continuing to have honest conversations about how we're not just what we're doing, but how we're working together as a team throughout the course of a year or a cycle working together. Um, so you have, to, you have to do that work of maintaining essentially healthy relationships and healthy structures. The other part of effective teams in general is just being really clear. What are, what's our agenda in advance? How are we preparing for it? And what are the outcomes that we're looking for? Um, each team more broadly needs a purpose for existence and what are the things that we do here? What goes on our agenda? What goes to other people? What things can we decide individually or collectively? Um, but then if we have an agenda item, what's the outcome? Are we having a discussion about it? That just sharing? Maybe there's an agenda item. I'm just going to vent for a minute. That's okay. We can have an agenda item to event, but vent. But most of the time, we need to have specific, concrete outcomes, and we need to revisit those and see if the follow-up steps were taken and assess and see if they work. Um, there's there's uh, a nice um, uh, sort of two two variable graph that uh, uh, someone who I work closely with, Elisa McDonald created, to think about teams which are both high function and high impact. 
and you, we've had experiences of being part of, uh, certainly you can imagine, a dysfunctional team that doesn't get anything done is low impact, low function. Uh, but so other teams, particularly in schools and in education, may be high functioning in that they get along well, they have routines and work well together, uh, but their impact on outcomes for students is negligible. Um, and so using that, that, that idea, and I've actually worked with that, taught that with teacher leaders, shared it with my teams, like, are we being high impact here? Are we being high functioning? And assessing ourselves and looking for areas to improve has kept us healthy. Um, so I was able to do some of those things in my earlier experience as a, the head of school at Brighton High School, working with a team of educators who are much more senior than I in their, in their roles. Um, and I've applied that in other places that I've gone. I did intensive coaching and work with that. Um, with teacher leaders and teams at Orchard Gardens, and then in my current role in Newton, working with the secondary principals. So we have a lot of those same routines. And it's re actually really gratifying for me in that work that I do leading the principals now, when I see them applying the way that we run our team meetings to their team meetings at their schools. So a lot of, a lot of times I'll go to me observe meetings at different schools and see folks applying directly things that they've learned or adapting them and improving them. And I see, I go to one of their meetings that they're leading with their team at their school and say, wow, that's a neat little twist on what we do. Let's do that back at our meeting. Um, and so it's created a healthy cycle. So I said at the beginning that I think everybody needs coaching and support in leading teams well. I like to provide that for other people and have experience in doing that. And I look for both my colleagues, even people that report to me, but certainly my, my supervisors and mentors to give me that feedback too. I have a follow up. Yep. As you just mentioned, everyone needs coaching and support. Yep. As a first time superintendent, where do you think in your first year you would need the most support? So I, I believe my strengths coming into this role um, are on the instructional side and, and uh, the supervisory side. I've experienced supervising principals, uh, other folks in our central office, in the Newton Public Schools. I have a lot of experience observing and supporting teachers and schools and teams. Um, in my current role, I work closely with the folks in our office who are responsible for the business finance and planning side of our district. Um, and have been able to collaborate and learn a lot from them, but it hasn't been my direct responsibility. So that's the, that's the part of the job that I think I would have the biggest learning curve in. Um, I, I have a lot of uh, thoughtful mentors that I work closely with in this area that I would rely on to do that, um, as well as uh, reaching out and accessing other, other support and learning from the expertise of, of this committee too. I know who's got a lot of uh, uh, years of experience and thoughtful perspective on that as well, but that's, that's my honest answer. Thank you. Ms. Kepson, will you play the role of President Ewing Campen for me? Thank you. How do you see after school activities benefiting students? Do you have any experience expanding after school programs either in your district role or as a principal? So I'll say it up front, I also I'm not part of your question, but I recognize the important role that after school programs play for just childcare for our families, particularly of our youngest youngest families and, and not to underestimate the, the need and try to meet the need uh, for families for af full day childcare. So that is part of the, the equation, I think, as we think about them, not your specific question. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, I, I, we do have significant experience in this area and, and thinking about how do we align our, our mission and our vision and the work that we're doing across all aspects of an organization. So. Um, in working at Orchard Gardens um, as a part of our, our turnaround school work there, we worked really closely with the partners in our community who in that, in that context were providing the after school and extended day care. So for us, that was the folks at Citizen Schools and at City Year who were working in the after school hours with our students and needing to really make sure that we were on the same page in terms of both the academic and the social emotional goals that we had for our students. And a lot of that was a, a reciprocal relationship where we were, we were working to provide support, professional development, feedback for the staff that was working with our students in the afternoon so that we could be working towards the same principles uh, and the same goals with them. Uh, and that was an incredibly impart, important part of our, our turnaround work at that school. Um, we were able to do that, in that case, universally for all students because of the context that we were working in. But I recognize there are other, there are other opportunities where that may not be as simple, but that shared, shared goals and then shared support, professional learning, um, and even sharing of resources where appropriate is how I think we're able to align what we're doing throughout the whole day. There's other examples um, that I've been involved in more recently 
one of the one of the roles that I supervise and organizations I supervise in Newton is Newton Community Education, and um, it's always been sort of a separate wing of our school district from the K through 12 part. But through working with uh, the director that we've hired there and and the staff, really think about where are the ways in which our community education arm can be aligned with the larger goals and principles and values that we're working off of, and what does it look like to sh to shift and adapt their programming to be. Um, to dovetail with what we're doing. So uh, not specifically after school care in that case, but out of school time learning and opportunities for both students and, and adults that I think ties in with that well. Actually, I'm gonna ask a follow up to that. Mm -hmm. um, specifically focusing your time at, at Orchard Gardens. Mm -hmm. So a key part of the story of the Toronto Orchard Gardens was the arts expansion work. Huge. Um, and but despite the success and despite the efforts of those like, like myself and, and an earlier position in my career and trying to sell that, that success, the role of the arts in, in being support and a driver of core learning still doesn't seem to be scaling. Um, how would you take that experience from Orchard Gardens and bring it to your work here in Somerville and in particular, what role do you see arts having in addressing things like opportunity gaps and social inequities? When, when we think about what makes students feel connected to school and want to get out of bed and come to school in the morning, more often than not, it has something to do with their engagement with the arts, their engagement with sometimes athletics or other extracurricular pursuits. And we need to realize that in, when we listen to our students, oftentimes it's those electives or extras that aren't valued uh, in the way that you describe necessarily are the most important thing in their day. Uh, and it's what it, what's keeps them going, it, what's, it, what's what makes them tick, it, what gets them in the right place to be able to go to their math class or their social studies class and participate and engage in thoughtful ways. Um, so I think we as, that's an area where we as adults have to take our cue from the students and listen to them and put that more centrally. Why hasn't that happened more and why isn't happening more often is, is certainly a, a, a great question. One of the specific ways where I see a connection to some of the conversations happening here in Somerville, and I want to, I want to be clear that I don't want to propose solutions beyond what my level of experience is, but one of the things that we did do at Orchard Gardens that was connected um, to what we're talking about here was our common planning time for our teacher teams was, was not just one, one period, but it was a double, double period within the elementary schedule um, every week. And that double period meant that there was double arts or other, other elective programming going on for our students. And it was really, a, we were doubling down in the arts while at the same time creating the time and space that our classroom and teachers in, in the homerooms in the elementary school needed to look at the data around the English and math results, to talk about specific students, to learn new curriculum or new instructional strategies, to meet their needs on the other parts of the academic academic side. So that's that's sort of a win-win and not an inexpensive win-win because it required additional staffing and support to create the opportunities for common planning time during the day. But that was, that was when you see a couple of those strategies on my resume or hear me talking about teacher leadership and teams and the arts, like what do those have to do with each other? Everything. And as kids progressed in age, they were able to even specialize and sort of major in some of these areas so they could get a, a double block of theater or a double block of dance if, that, if that's where their passion was um, in, as they got older in the K to eight spectrum. Um, and the result was, you know, had ripple of positive effects. We had students who were performing and creating artwork at, at a much higher level, it drew families into the school for our art shows, which were, which were epic events for our theater performances, for dance performances, because it was just amazing quality and entertainment and the pride in the school and the community that developed from that flowed out of that commitment to the arts, which was also supporting the, our academic improvement at the same time. So not that that specific strategy is one that we should necessarily be doing here. Some of it I don't know enough to say, but looking for ways where we can do, do two things at once and further the importance of the arts and those other things that connect students to school and also meet the other academic goals we have. All right. Thank you. So my next category is mine, and it's multilingual learners. Uh, <clears throat> so Somerville, is, I won't say unique because it's a growing number of districts that, that have this situation, 
but Somerville is definitely notable for being an overwhelmingly white city with overwhelmingly people of color, students in the public school system, particularly about half our students identify as, as, as immigrants. Um, how, how do you address that disconnect, or that difference, rather, especially in issues of parent voice, parent power, when the parents who, say, vote for school committee and the parents who send their schools, students to schools aren't necessarily the same group of people? Mm -hmm. So one of the strategies I've seen that's really effective and I didn't learn as much today as I would like to, I'd love to come back and learn more, is, is understanding the more, more the role of the parent liaisons that I understand exist in, in all of the K through eight. So that wasn't part of our, our visit today and didn't get to engage with those folks. But I, I see the, that role as being a key linchpin in drawing in new and different communities to so those that have been uh, traditionally or historically represented in the leader, formal leadership roles in the city and in the schools. And it seems to me from the folks that I did meet from the, um, the um, Family Learning Engagement Center, they're, they're bilingual, bicultural folks in many of those roles who are from the community or are connected to the community in authentic ways and can really uh, both, both draw people in but reach out into the other community spaces where, where folks from immigrant communities or communities of color might be gathering that aren't part of the typical um, um, you know, power, power connections within the city and bring them into the school leadership, bring them into PTOs, creating like spaces. I know I, I, we've, we've had a lot of success creating a family center in the schools where I've been a leader both at Brighton High School and Orchard Gardens, which is literally a welcoming space close to the front door that has access to resources and where people can gather, not just because we've called a meeting they need to come in, but because they've dropped their child off, they're waiting to go somewhere, or they're coming in the evening for a meeting, and there's also information about the other partnerships and resources we have, whether they be resources dedicated to food insecurity or healthcare or other aspects of, um, of life that all folks might need support with. Um, so those, those family centers staffed by bilingual cultural people, and again, I, by cultural people, I wanna, I wanna learn more about what our resources are, and, and being able to help that to funnel more people into interest in being on, on PTOs or PTAs, running, running for office perhaps, or making other kind of investments in the school in the formal leadership structures that are set up, where I think you're pointing out we're not, we're not hearing those voices in a representative way. Okay, so that ends the go around. So I will now open the floor to members. Dr. Phillips. Thanks. I'm interested in learning more about how you think and strategize as a politician. Um, so imagine that you and us want something from someone else at the city or the state or a different department. Maybe we want a bigger budget. Maybe we want a school build tomorrow. Maybe we want the police to operate differently. Maybe we want HHS to operate differently. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, right? Okay. All hypothetically. Um, aside from having a killer pitch about why we need what we want, mm -hmm. how do you figure out how to get us what we want? Great. Um, well, it's a cliche, but it's true. Re you know, relationships are so important in these kind of uh, these kind of things and and it's not just relationship sort of like I'll scratch you about your back if you scratch mine or you know old school backroom politics like versions of relationships but really like understanding where people are coming from what their background is what their motivations are it makes such a difference in the ability to collaborate with others if that applies to we, the earlier question about how I work how we work together in teams right if you don't know who the person you're collaborating with on anything is and where they come from and what makes them tick you're less likely to be able to work together and come up with new solutions. Um, so those relationships, I think, have to underscore that to be successful in a political realm or otherwise. And again, not, at, not saying that that leads to favors being cut or any kind of preferential things, but that's just how people work together. Um, sometimes it's a question of advocating for a scarce amount of resources, right, and getting, getting our slice of the pie or our fair share of the resources, and that that does require really clear pitches to be made for what we need and why. Sometimes those pitches, I think, need to be made to a third party, which is maybe the, the public, the electorate, or other groups of influential um, folks in the community and not just 
uh, sort of face to face, but make, you know, a lot of conversations go better in private than they go in public. Other conversations go better in public than they do in private based on getting more stakeholders, if not at the table, at least listening to what's happening at the table. Um, so I think that could, that could be another strategy. I certainly, we never want to embarrass anybody or do anything to, to call out behavior, but just making sure if we're starting from shared values and shared expectations, that everybody knows the choices we're making and how they, they may or may not be aligned with those at any given time. Um, so I think that would be another important part of that. Um, and then I think that the third part, and it goes back to the relationships and working together well as a team, oftentimes there, there are third and fourth and fifth options out there versus just a, 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 a diametrically opposed set of things and fighting over resources. So if you're gonna come up, brainstorm, and think outside the box to create possible win-win situations, um, you need to have a relationship. You need to have a working uh, connection so that you're able to get into dialogues and think outside the box. And that applies to any different kind of um, uh, relationship that you might have, with, whether it's with the teachers association or with with folks in the city city hall or in other um, other parts of the work we're doing. That that ability to come up with better solutions than the ones that are initially presented requires relationship. It requires time and space and trust. Dr. Ackman. Thank you. What is your interest and experience in uh, securing grant funds for um, projects that are, you know, enhance the outcomes for the students we're looking to serve? Yeah. Um, so I have lots of experience with, with grant funding while working in, in the Boston Public Schools, less so in the last eight years in the Newton Public Schools, based on the, the higher level of affluence of our community overall. It has not, not been as big a big part of what we do and where we get our funding for important strategic ideas. Though even still within that context, oftentimes we're able to make a strong pitch for something within the Newton community and get funding from our Newton Schools Foundation or, or businesses or other private groups in the, in the city. Um, but I think, Thinking both at the small small level and at the largest level in my work in Boston at Brighton High at, at Orchard Gardens even at English um, is thinking about like what's a need that we have and and who out there in the larger world might be interested in collaborating around this um, and so trying to do that matching in your brain it requires having a really good network and knowledge of what the resources are in the community and the assets that are out there and the interests of different possible funders or other community institutions. I do not have that at all right now in Somerville as I'm relatively new to learning about this community, but I know just at these tables here and beyond that, there's probably a wealth of resources about that. So it's, as you're articulating, what is it we need? What would we wanna do doing some of that blue sky? Like if we had more resources, what would we do with it? Try to package that and then also think about where, where would that land well? Where would there be an interest in that and making that connection? And then obviously there's the technical part of having folks who know how to write, you know, write grant proposals and write things up, but the, that usually happens. Usually it's not a sort of a cold call version of I wrote a proposal and it got accepted by someone I've never met, but rather matching our interests and our, and our needs with the resources and the interests of folks in the community or in, in funding communities. And the interruption. According to your resume, you only spent five years as a teacher before moving into an administrative position. How do you ensure that you continue to be able to identify and empathize with the current struggles that teachers face? Yeah, great question. I've, I've, uh, I'm very aware of that and taken that to heart. I, I did do a lot of teaching as an undergraduate as well that informed me, but that's not the same thing as actually doing the work day in and day out. Um, and in, in my graduate school work as well. So I spend a lot of time in classrooms is the number one thing that I do to make sure that that happens. I can't do my job if I don't know what's happening in classrooms. That's where school happens is in classrooms every day. So in my current role, I spend three mornings a week uh, shadowing a principal or another administrator in our schools. And uh, that's not just time spent huddled in an office talking about teaching, it's spent time in classrooms uh, when I visit classrooms, I'm watching and, and learning from what the teachers are doing. I'm, I'm talking to the students or observing the students and seeing what's being asked of them and, and what, that, what that feels like. And then um, 
I always write, I mean, if I'm not able to talk to the teacher in the moment, I'm always writing and following up with them to, first of all, just appreciate being welcomed in their classroom. And we got to go to a bunch of terrific classrooms across the, the district today. It was really fun. It was the best part of my day. I'm really looking forward to hearing, as an aside, that the, I want to hear the end of the story that one of our uh, first graders in the Unidos program was writing about a, uh, a spider and a snake who were somehow formed into a single animal in a, in a barrel of toxic waste and the in adventures that ensued. So, you know, knowing what's going on with our students is really fun uh, in that context as well. But to, to your question, knowing and seeing what's going on in classrooms on a regular basis as a part of my work in the schools is crucial. Um, and that's, that's super helpful to see. But then complementing that in the second part of my answer is around talking and listening to teachers and being able to be there. I take great pride in being in the schools a lot, not just for what I just described, but uh, the teachers in the schools where I work now, the teachers in the schools where I've worked before uh, know me when they see me in the hallways, they're happy to see me, whether, whether I've been in their classroom or we're just passing, and they feel comfortable letting me know what their experiences are. Um, and so I'm not, I not try to be less reactive to the experiences that teachers have, but really deeply understanding what it's like for them right now. Right now is an incredibly hard time to be an educator in this country, in, in the schools where I work, and I'm sure here in the Somerville Public Schools. Um, and we need to look, give a lot of support. We need to look, give a lot of grace. We need to ha you know, bring our own social emotional uh, skills to the fore in supporting people who are working so hard with, with our students. Um, and so listening to them is one of the ways that we can do that and try to offer what they need. Yep. So I have a follow up to that. To your point about this being a very difficult time to educate in America, and if, as we all know, there's a teacher shortage, a growing one. Um, against that backdrop, we have adopted a goal. We want to increase the diversity of our, of our teaching staff mm -hmm. to better match our, our student population. Given the difficulty of the moment to be a teacher and a teacher shortage, how would you go about trying to recruit a more diverse teaching staff? Yeah. I'll just put a plug in. It's also a really hard to time to be an educational leader as well. So um, grace and support for, for those of us in those roles as well. Um, it, it's, it's incredibly important to achieve any of the goals that we've talked about here today or to live out the values that I was describing earlier that guide uh, so much of my work. So I, I could answer that question in, in, in two parts about the hiring process and how we hire for positions and then how we support, support uh, folks who are underrepresented in our workforce right now once they're hired. I've done a lot of work with the hiring process, um, particular in hiring, for me, for, for in hiring, hiring principals and, and directors who work in, in the schools that I'm in now, uh, but also supporting those folks in the hiring that they're doing for teachers and looking really caref carefully at the hiring process uh, we have to make sure we have diverse hiring uh, committees that include people from many different backgrounds and particularly those from underrepresented communities that we're trying to attract. We have to think carefully about what our standards are and, and when, we're, when we're evaluating resumes or looking at applications or ta thinking about how people from how they dress to how they responded to the level, uh, level of uh, formality and how some of those standards may not be relevant to the actual uh, qualities that we're looking for but are historical um, uh, artifacts of a system that, that's not really aligned with our outcomes. We've got a, um, I have folks on hiring committees I'm on do reading about um, unconscious bias and, and anti-racist hiring practices at the start of the process. And then we check in throughout each stage of the hiring process to see how our outcomes are aligned or not aligned with the results that we're trying to get and go back and reflect on, did we eliminate people earlier in this process that maybe we, we needed to think differently about if we were really enacting those principles? Um, I've been really pleased that of the, when I got to Newton, the six, the six principles that I worked with directly were all white males, and now we have uh, three people of color and uh, four women on that team uh, of six uh, that as a part of some of those hiring practices. Um, and those are folks that are doing the work and following some of those models that we've set at the district level in their, in their hiring practices at the school level for teachers. And then, and then um, supporting and retaining folks once they're hired. Um, it, it, the more staff of color, the more people from underrepresented groups we hire, 
the better environment we create where, they, where you have colleagues that, that you can connect with in affinity groups, where you have people that have paved the way in creating spaces that are, that are supportive uh, for people like you and can see yourself in leadership roles as well. Um, so that, I think that's super important. And then again, continuing to listen, I mentioned the feedback loop with our students feeling disconnected from schools earlier uh, or not connected at the same levels. Uh, the same applies to our staff. So when we have people that leave, what are the exit surveys and interviews we're doing? And where are, we, where are their experiences going wrong if they're not feeling good about staying and working longer? Um, and if they are, enlisting them, if they are staying and they are feeling positive, enlisting them if they're willing to be part of an effort um, to support their colleagues, attract new colleagues, um, and thinking about that part of it as well. So we have a few buildings that are in need of work, let's just say. And, so I've heard and um, seen. It's going to require some long-term planning mm -hmm. as well as short-term planning of if a new building is built, where those students will learn while that is happening, et cetera. So do you have any experience doing that kind of planning, mm -hmm. and what does that look like? So I mentioned earlier that I, you know, I have really strong colleagues in the business finance and planning roles in, in my current district. And so I've collaborated with them on, on some redistricting um, processes. And I've, I've worked alongside them in some of our school building and um, renovations that we've done, but it hasn't been my direct area of responsibility. Uh, but I, I do understand a lot of the best practices in that area of uh, creating long-term enrollment projections to make sure we know what we expect to see in terms of uh, student enrollment and where, what areas of the city they would be from so we can match that to the, to the classroom spaces in different areas, looking at um, and projections from different sources as well. I know we get some very generic ones from the, the regional um, enrollment group, I think it's NESDEC, but we also, uh, there's a lot of very unique situations here in Somerville with the extension of the Green Line and the development of Assembly Square. And I know the, the focus on trying to keep housing affordable in the context of that, I know you've worked a lot on that, Mayor. And so what does that mean for our enrollment and how families moving in versus younger people without kids and, and where will they be in the city? So there's tons of analysis I think that has, has to happen to undergird that. We actually had a great conversation um, this afternoon with some staff at, um, at the high school and who had gathered after school and thinking about how does the work that we're doing on building and reconstruction and districting impact our equity goals and, and what might we do differently with how we assign students to the buildings that we have or that we may, may build or rebuild or, or cycle out of use that would create more or less segregation based on race, based on socioeconomics um, and really uh, walk the walk the talk there. So I think that has to, that equity lens has to be factored into that as well. And that's where I think, um, you know, enacting our values will be, will be helpful and, and could lead to some of those, uh, you know, hard trade-offs that um, Chair Green, you mentioned earlier, uh, if we look at resources going to certain buildings or not others, or creating spaces that are, are likely to be more uh, heterogeneous when they're filled with students um, could be part of that conversation as well. So I think I, I think I answered your question, but want to make sure I touched all parts of it. Ms. Patone. Through you, Chair Green. Can you share an experience where your intent did not align with the actual impact on others? Um, what did you do to remedy the situation or restore the relationship or relationships? Um, one experience I had in this regard, well, I, I appreciate the frame of your question. Let me just say before you start and the importance of acknowledging in, not just intent but impact in, in making sure that the actions that we all take are aligned with our values. and. Um, Without that lens, I don't think any of us are able to, to, to fully reflect and improve in the way that we need to. So it, it, I think it's a terrific question um, and, and one that we should all ask ourselves. And I, I think everybody should have multiple answers to that question if we're really being serious about um, uh, trying to continuously improve and do better and do better from an equity lens. Uh, I can think of a, a specific experience that um, was also a powerful learning experience for me because of that. Um, in, the, in the height of the pandemic or that first summer uh, before we tried to reopen schools in uh, uh, mostly virtual or hybrid format, 
was 2020, I guess. Um, we worked feverishly all summer long, our faces glued to the Zoom, trying to reinvent schools and what they would look like in, in this new electronic uh, world with a global health pandemic. Um, so I worked all summer long with a team of educators that included teachers and uh, administrators and union leaders and um, fo folks in therapeutic roles and special ed administrators to redesign both the middle school schedules in Newton and the high school schedules in Newton. Uh, we were exhausted. It was a really trying process. Um, but I had some strong feelings about what the, the schedules should look like for our, for our uh, virtual learning at the middle school level. Um, and I felt, it was specifically, I really felt strongly about how important it would be to have some larger blocks of time than we had necessarily had during what at the time is a very traditional middle school schedule of like seven shorter 40, 45, 50 minute classes throughout the course of the day. And I had a lot of strong feelings about the how exhausting that would be for particularly for middle school students to be on a zoom and constantly getting off a of zoom and, and and doing seven classes in a day and um that that would not be the uh, an optimum learning environment and that we should have some longer blocks and some rotation of the classes and what i what i i was really forceful in pushing for that at a certain point i think once i got really exhausted with the process and and wasn't sure that we were going to come to a consensus in time to have a plan but what i ended up doing was not hearing and not listening not uh, not drawing out the feedback from some of the special educators and special education administrators who were who were part of that team and and knew that daily structure and touches for students with certain disabilities were were crucial to them being able to be successful throughout the rest of the day whether it was virtual or otherwise and if we created a schedule that didn't have those opportunities because the class wasn't meeting every day or cycling through for academic support or something else that we were creating a schedule that was going to be inequitable, inequitably designed for those students. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I couldn't hear that, and I, I didn't accept that because I got too caught up in my own beliefs that I was trying to, I think, rightly help others understand that weren't hearing what I had to say. Uh, but I'm really grateful uh, for, for one of the assistant principals in one of our middle schools who called me out on it. And she pulled me, you know, those are the days in which you had to schedule another Zoom to have the side conversation. You couldn't do it on your way out of the room. Um, and she, call, she called me out on it and uh, with a lot of emotion told me how, how um, difficult the way I was approaching this challenge was and how I seemed to be like erasing the needs in her eyes uh, of her students. There are all, all our students, but the students that she was supporting. Um, and it was humbling and I, I had to say sorry and I had to um, just, shut up and listen, um, and then figure out, we were pretty far into the summer, what changes we could make and how we could adjust what we were doing to better meet their needs. I think we made some, some changes to the schedule, but um, it was, it was a, a, a reminder, particularly when we're really sure we're right, is probably a time when we may be totally unaware or not reflective enough at the start on what the impact of what we're doing is gonna be. Um, so that was, that was a moment that fit that for me, and I think, learned a ton from that experience, really appreciative of the person that, that was so frank and direct with me, um, and continue to, I, I'm sure as we all do, continue to make mistakes where, where, where our impact's not aligned with our intentions, but each, with each step and each iteration of that reflection get better and less likely to make certain mistakes. Probably ready to make new mistakes as the next, next part of that. I will never, never stop, but that's, that's where I am. Anyone else? Going once, Mr. Tone. Through you, Chair Green. Um, for each candidate, um, I think one member of the school committee kind of tried to call out the thing that was obvious about you know someone's experience that may or may not be a parallel with what Somerville is. So if you can speak to, I think one example for you is that you've spent the last eight years in Newton and it's a very different community mm -hmm. um, with a different demographic. Um, how can you, um, I guess, convince constituents, you know, the broad stakeholders that, um, you know, I know you have other experience, but how this experience shouldn't be, um, you're still ready for Somerville and you're in a good place to move forward and support a community like Somerville, even though you have spent the last seven or eight years in a very different community. Yeah. Well, I, I will just say one of the reasons I'm excited about this opportunity, and as I said earlier, this is the only superintendent position that I've applied for, is because I do feel 
that have shared values and commitments to the district, as I said earlier, um, and also that, that my experience and my background, I think, has prepared me really well for the position and not having just worked only in, in Somerville or a district like Somerville my whole career. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I've worked in a lot of different kinds of schools, different levels, different roles, different contexts, and I think in each step it's made me stronger. The big shift that I've made in the past was I went from working almost 20 years in Boston to Newton. Newton is more diverse than, than most people outside of Newton know, but still a very, very different context. And I, I had this moment of learning from that shift, which is that everything that I was learning about the, my work in Newton fell in two categories. It was either very much the same as things that I had seen and observed and learned working in, in, in much more urban schools because kids, teachers, schools, communities are, are the same wherever you go. And a lot of the same patterns were happening and I was able to apply directly learning that from one environment to a totally different one. And then the other half of things were completely different because the history, the context, the resources, and the background really matter and can make one, one pattern completely unrecognizable in a different context because of those things. What I needed to do was have the wisdom to figure out which bucket, of the, which of those two buckets things fell in often and whether I could quickly apply and really zip ahead of, of folks that were grappling with something because I had been there and done that even in a different context and I, I had some experiences that were relevant to help move the conversation forward or whether I needed to shut up and listen and just really try to understand what was going on in this new context and apply the educational and leadership learning that I had done to it, but with, with the humility to know like this is not what I've done before. Um, and I think I'll bring that same lens to, to a, a, a transition that I would make from Newton back to a more urban environment like the one that I came up in as an educator and was my educational home for the first 20 years of my career. Um, and, and again, it's, it's, it is the, the diversity, and, uh, and I say that in a socioeconomic sense, obviously racial, ethnic, uh, all, the, all different factors of that are immigrant and, and multilingual learner population um, here that, that attracts me to Somerville, and I think because of the, the diversity of background that I've had, uh, I think I can apply that well here. Yep. Ms. Parrish. Thank you, Chair, through you. Um, I spoke with a number of people who have worked with you in the past, and one thing that um, was common across them was uh, they all referred to your unwavering commitment to equity. How do you keep that, how do you renew that commitment? Um, how do you sustain that commitment? And how do you encourage those around you um, to do the same? I'm not sure if I know. <laughs> I, I think, um, so continuous learning has certainly been a part of that. So folks that you talk to that maybe I worked with 10 or 15 years ago, they were able to identify that as a value in me. I, I really appreciate they could do that because I didn't know anything about a lot of these topics 10 or 15 years ago as a white man who grew up in a, in a world where we were uh, in the majority far less critical of those things. Um, and so I've continuous learning and understanding from my peers, from people with experiences different than mine, uh, from reading uh, and, and professional books and, and you know popular books. Um, I can think of how powerful a book like um, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book was for, for myself, I'm sure many other, pe other white people in explaining and understanding the depths of racism in this country and how it's experienced by people of color. Um, but each, each, of that, each layer of that learning for me, I think has like renewed my commitment to the values that, that as I said at the beginning, have, have guided my career, um, but understanding in a much more uh, thoughtful, effective way, hopefully, um, how to operationalize that and support others in that learning. Um, so I think it's a, it's a terrific question for me to reflect on too, but that's my answer for now. Thank you. I have a, okay, I have a question. Um, so twice now, once in reference to students, and once in reference to, to um, faculty and, and staff, you have mentioned the role of students of color, staff of color, in having to help with outreach. Um, frankly, this, this concerns me because 
this is something that, this is something Somerville is very good at, which is mm -hmm. a bunch of white people build a, build a thing, then they ask people of color very nicely to join it, and if one or two joins it, they go, oh, okay, okay can you help us get more? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's data about how one of the things driving for faculty, for, 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 for teachers of color, driving them out of the field, is this fact that being a teacher of color comes with a longer job description. Um, what, what, what would you do with that? Yeah. First of all, I, it's great feedback that, you know, in the, the pattern in my responses that, that are concerning to you, and um, I need to listen and learn from that and, and not make that mistake. I, w I will say I've, I do think about that a great deal, that, that tax that our educators of color feel of being asked to do much more than others and step into roles that are not in their job description. Um, I want to say that in, in, in practice, I've been thoughtful about that. I think I did mention earlier that if people choose to participate in those, they have that opportunity and not to expect that from folks um, because it's not fair uh, and the burden that that, that creates on them. Uh, but knowing that we all need to be leaders in this work, whether white educators or from any other background, it's, it's our responsibility uh, to speak up and address things when they happen. It's our responsibility to take the lead um, in recruiting others, whether recruiting others was one of the contexts that were in, was in your question, um, and we can't simply rely on others to do that. Um, so I, your question is, is well put, and it includes feedback from me, which I appreciate, and, and also why you know I've been mindful of that, uh, that dynamic and that potential pitfall in the work that I've been doing to not do, to not do that wherever possible, uh, where people um, weren't, weren't ready for that commitment. Going once, going twice. All right, I think that concludes our questions. Thank you very much. Uh, you have the last word. Great. Um, well, it's been a pleasure to be here today. Um, it's been an exciting day for me. I mentioned to, to many folks throughout the day that the opportunity to spend time and visit uh, so many schools in Somerville and meet with so many talented folks from the community and from the schools, educators, students was uh, professional development for me, a chance to, to walk in some other shoes and, and see another district in schools and how things are going. I've learned a ton from the experience um, and remain equally, if not more, excited than I, than I started the day about the opportunities here and the, the belief that my background and experiences leave me well prepared um, to lead the district. And um, thank you for your consideration. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, having no further business before this body, we are adjourned. I'll see everyone on Monday, everyone, not you, everyone else on Monday. Thanks. <laughs>